stay in history A death has beaten you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave The life eternal, you have won my day Shout it out, Jesus is alive Let's give our kids one more round of applause as they head out. All right, we'd like to welcome you to Guelphie Baptist Church this morning. Uh, we have got a lot going on, as you can see, as our, our kids head back for their children's church hour. Uh, a lot going on in the next Sunday as well. A reminder that is Easter Sunday. We will be beginning at 7 o'clock uh, right outside the windows here. I'll be gathering next to the crosses for our sunrise service starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, that will be followed by a time of breakfast and fellowship from 8.15 until 9.45. If you have not signed up yet and are planning to come to breakfast either uh, before your worship service or after the uh, sunrise service, please sign up in the next few days so we make sure we've got enough food for everyone. There's a, a QR code in the bulletin, um, or you can also go on the Church Center app and sign up under the Events tab. Um, also, if you're coming to the Sunrise service, uh, please be sure to bring a lawn chair with you, um, because there will be a time that you're probably going to want to sit. So if you would bring one of those with you uh, next Sunday, again, we'll be meeting right outside the, uh, the doors here, starting at 7 a.m. A reminder, this afternoon, uh, our 5 o'clock adult time uh, will be a time of worship and uh, getting to hear from Chris Derry. He is the uh, Director of Church and Campus Engagement for the International Mission Board. Uh, he'll be speaking about 
some of the projects they have going on and how we as a church can better support their missionaries. So please come out this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Uh, women's Bible study will be starting up uh, this upcoming Saturday, 8 o'clock, at the Panera Bread down at Virginia Center Commons. If you can't make it every uh, week, they'll be meeting on the last Saturday of the month. If you can't make it every week, that is okay. Just come when you can. Again, that'll be from 8 to 9, uh, Virginia Center Commons, Panera Bread. And uh, lastly, uh, the Christ in the Passover, a special event as we get ready for for Easter and the Passover, uh, Rabbi uh, David Wynn from Tikvot Israel Messianic Synagogue will be here uh, this upcoming Wednesday evening. Uh, no official equip night. We won't be breaking into groups, but everyone will be here in the sanctuary starting at 6.30 for that time together. And don't forget, uh, we are wrapping up our Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering. Still two more weeks to give as we try to push towards that $12,000 goal. Uh, there are envelopes in the uh, offering and tithes uh, box on the, next to that, or you can also give through the church. Center app. Uh, and also this afternoon, Adventure Kids, uh, Adventure Club meets at uh, 5 o'clock. The youth will get a head start on them. They'll meet at 4 30 this afternoon. But if you would bow your heads, uh, we'll open up our service in a word of prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, everyone who is here with us this morning. We just thank you for the beautiful day, for the abundant sunshine. We just ask that you uh, prepare our hearts and our minds for the uh, time of worship as we sing to you and uh, just hear the message from Pastor Mike as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So almost as soon as VBS was over last year, um, I started getting the sneak peeks of the themes that they um, presented. And there was one in particular that I thought for sure I was going to use. The theme was fun. It was super colorful. And I knew that the decorations were going to be amazing. So I started with all these great big plans. Um, but then they released like the music and then the biblical content. And it just I knew that it wasn't the right fit. Um, and so I was disappointed um, and knew I had to find a different theme. I recently read a blog that referred to VBS as the Super Bowl of Kids Ministry. We all know that the Super Bowl is about more than just the football game itself. I know personally I watch the Super Bowl for the commercials, the food, and the music halftime show. Similar to the Super Bowl, in order to be successful, we feel like VBS has to have it all. It's got to have really good music, the decorations, and the biblical content. But as I started looking at the other themes and trying to figure out which one to use for us this year, God again reminded me that the message being presented and the biblical content was really the only thing that mattered. Everything else, everything else can be adjusted around that. Um, and so with that, I realized that for this year, there was really only one clear choice that we had. Our kids live in a world that's so different from the ones that any of us lived in. Life is hard. Stress and anxiety in even younger kids are at an all-time high, and opinions are plenty. Everyone has a personal opinion on everything, and phrases like love is love and do what makes you happy is thrown around and plastered everywhere. This gives our kids a false sense of hope and acceptance. I'm sorry, but not everything that's branded as love is love. And we are not supposed to do what just makes ourselves happy or even those around us happy. We are commanded to do what makes God happy. We are supposed to stand out. We are supposed to be set apart. We are supposed to find our identity in him. Our kids need a strong foundation, a solid rock to stand on that reminds them of who he says they are instead of the distorted, confusing half-truths that the world is constantly throwing at them. This is exactly what our VBS theme for this year does. It shows kids a comparison between what the world tells them and what God is telling them, and then it backs it up with biblical proof. This is what our kids need to hear for the time in which they are living. But in order to bring about this message and to be able to give the VBS to our community, I need your help. So I set up a table in the foyer where you can go fishing to find your role at Vacation Bible School. So if you've already filled out my form and kind of told me that you wanted to serve in what areas, I kind of like plotted it in, in little tables on the board. So you can look and see. You don't need to do it if you've already signed up. But if you haven't, you can go fishing and you can look at the different roles um, to see what holes need to be filled. And then you write your name on the back of the fish and you drop it in the bucket. And then Randall has a sign-up sheet for Family Fun Day, which we kind of use as our kickoff to VBS. And so um, we need a lot of help still to fill the spots there so we can do that. So now I'd like to share with you our theme for this year's VBS and welcome you to Breaker Rock Beach.
Let's go that way. The nail's going this way. Nope, we're going that way. Wait for me, guys. Breaker Rock Beach. Among the shifting sands of Breaker Rock Beach, there's a rock that stands the test of time. Rock Beach. Kids will learn to look past the half-truths of the world to see the rock-solid truth of God's Word. Don't miss Lifeway's 2024 VBS, Breaker Rock Beach. All of those kids, though. It's a big act. <laughs>
merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 One more time, a little better? Amen. Okay, yeah, that's better. I like the big David amen over here, man. I can feel it. I love it. <laughs> so this is a, a, just a, an awesome today to be here to just worship God with all we have. What I want us to do is we need to just take a moment and just be quiet, still our hearts, still our minds, leave everything of the world outside those doors and focus our attention fully on worshiping a loving Savior. So let's just take a few minutes and spend some time with the Lord. And please take time to just bring any unconfessed sin, unrepentant sin to Him now.
Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the Psalms. That's with an S, Denny. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 24. And I'm going to read Psalm 24. This is the King of Glory. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Let us pray. Most gracious, holy, loving, heavenly Father, O king of glory, we thank you so much for this time to be in your house to worship you, to turn our hearts and our minds towards you, to turn away from the things of this earth, to focus on you, Lord. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for your son that shed his blood and died and took on all your wrath for our sins. Father, I ask and pray for each and every person here, for every heart and every mind that they will be open, that you're preparing them now to receive your word. You're preparing them now to just hear your word. You're preparing them now to turn to you and to just turn over and repent. Father, we thank you so much, and we pray for our pastor today as he brings a message, Lord. Lord, I pray, and I know that it is the message that at least I know one person in here is to hear today. Father, thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for being with us and loving us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody out. A couple of quick reminders. Next Sunday, as we know, is Resurrection Sunday. So I encourage you to come and join us. We will be having our sunrise service at 7 o'clock right out here. And then we will have a breakfast between, so you can stay for breakfast, or if you'd rather come at 10 a.m. You come at 11 a.m., you're going to catch the tail end of everything. So we're doing that, so we have the breakfast in the middle. But I will tell you and encourage you, uh, there are actually two very different messages next Sunday. So don't feel bad if you come and spend the whole day with us. We'd be okay with that. We, we, we wouldn't mind that at all. It'd be a good day in the house of the Lord. So we are going to be uh, doing that. Make sure you do uh, remember to bring a chair. It looks like a really nice day. It's going to be in the uh, low 70s, but probably upper 40s to 50 at sunrise. So bring a you know, blanket or, or your whatever barn fire thing you bring. Uh, just want to also thank Troy for uh, stepping in last week. Did an awesome job uh, handling God's Word. You know, one thing about preaching expositionally through entire books of the Bible is uh, you don't get to pick your favorite text. Right? Pastors like to pick their favorite text sometimes because that way they've got a confidence. No, this way you've got to prepare because you, I may be able to give them a couple months notice on what they're going to be preaching, but you've got to do the hard work. You've got to spend some time studying God's word, uh, seeking God's wisdom and guidance through the spirit. So uh, when you see these guys up here uh, preaching, uh, you know, at different times, know that they've had to put the work in to be prepared. So I really appreciate that because uh, it's a lot that goes into that. Uh, we uh, just learned last weekend that apparently you should be spending 20 to 25 hours a week preparing for God's word uh, to be delivered, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, church people take up a lot of time, not being critical. But, you know, but think about that. 20 to 25 hours 
to really uh, spend time preparing to deliver God's word. Because that's what we're here for. We are here to hear from God. We're going to be in the end of uh, Matthew, but uh, I found out, I guess I've shifted somehow recently. I'm now in the old guys camp. I was at a luncheon uh, with a pastor last Sunday. We were, uh, it was a bunch of senior pastors. And somehow I ended up the second oldest pastor there, which I'm not sure <laughs> when that happened. But, and I'm not sure, the guy beside me was Spanish. He's a pastor of a church in Spain, and he kept telling me I was supposed to be sitting where he was, but I just, I just kept saying, no, no hablo inglés. <laughs> and um, anyway, so he stayed where he was, but I was sitting between a Spanish pastor, uh, next to me was a Colombian pastor, beside him was a Chinese pastor, and beside him was a French pastor. So it was like Waldo, like what doesn't fit here in this seat? Uh, and they were not, and they were here from those countries. So it's just, uh, uh, just incredibly encouraging. Uh, I was greatly appreciative. And with that same thing, I want to encourage you to come back tonight. I know uh, you maybe not have gotten accustomed to that now, but we are going to have a tremendous night. We have got uh, Chris Darius, as mentioned, mentioned from the International Mission Board. Chris is a dear brother, a great friend, and we're going to be talking about ways we can further partner with our international missionaries. There are uh, between 36, 3,700 international missionaries. Uh, Chris is going to share with us. We're looking into ways we can adopt an unengaged, unreached people group. So these are people groups who have no known gospel witness. There is no missionary. There is no church. There is, uh, to, to what we can uh, figure out they've never heard the gospel. Uh, you're going to hear about other things going on. Project 3000, which is an incredible initiative uh, to get people, probably younger people, uh, that are going to be trekking into literally uh, some jungle communities, some, some off the beaten path in many cases. They're going to be setting the maps for missionaries to eventually go into these people groups. It's going to be awesome. We're going to look at ways we can be a uh, better partner with particularly missionaries that we would say are orphaned. And those are missionaries uh, through the IMB that do not have a sending church that any longer is connected with them. Uh, they get financial support. Lottie Moon is, is, is a great way to help them. But they need churches that they know are not only praying for them, but keeping up with them. So whether it's through uh, care packages, it's going to be great. And I tell you what, I'm just gonna, I'm very selfishly asking you if you can anyway. I, I really want uh, you know Chris to, to, to come tonight. What he's going to share is going to be just of great value to us as both a body and individually. So if you're around 5 o'clock tonight and you get a chance to not only do that, get to meet him as well. Uh, where's Lauren at? Is Lauren in here? Lauren, I was talking to Chris on Friday, and he was like, Lauren works for the IMB now, and she's like, Chris, was this a spam? Is this some, an internal spam from the IMB? He's like, no, I'm going to be at your church Friday night. So, Lauren, you have to be here tonight because if you're not, it's going to make us look really bad. Now, anyway, we're, we're excited, but I want to encourage you as well with that token. Uh, we, we're seriously, when we ask you to be in prayer, we need to really continue to be in prayer. We are really getting uh, into some deep stuff in terms of just seeing what God's doing. I had shared with you uh, two weeks ago, we were at our, per, our, our, um, our state convention has its church plan assessment retreat this past week. So uh, four of us and the other three uh, outside of me do more work than I do. My work's always leading up to the event. Uh, but we're immersed for two solid days. And I'm talking like literally 12 to 15 hour days as assessing future church planners. And one of them uh, was Eric Josephson. And their church used air facilities last night, which is such an incredible blessing to be able to uh, allow a church to come in who's getting ready to plant here in the Ashland area uh, a mile from us, but a gospel-centered, Bible-teaching church. And we need plenty. Uh, I was sharing an early service. Uh, we don't quite fathom in our country, you know, football's kind of like the big sport here, I guess, if you would, as far as great crowds. But universally, in, you know, across the globe, it's still soccer, which is actually originally called football, but that gets real confusing with uh, Americans. But if you go into most parts around Europe and other areas of the world, you will see a 60 to 70,000 seat stadium uh, within walking distance of another one. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like just crazy stuff, but it's awesome at the same time. And, and so we're cool. You know, we are cool with a church planting a mile from us. We want to support them in every way we can. Uh, Eric and uh, Carmen, his wife, came through assessment this week with eight other couples. And, uh, but this is spiritual warfare, folks. The enemy is not excited about new gospel works being raised up and planted out because it is just statistically proven that new churches reach more people. Just statistically 
hopefully more people come to faith. Um, so we want to be in prayer for them and continually excited. But hey, we're in the midst of all this, okay? I mean, we had, again, four of us from this church in the midst of uh, overseeing a large part of this church plant movement, not only in Air State, two of, our, uh, two of the churches that were assessed this week were from Oklahoma. And uh, so we're, 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 we're just, God's just doing some incredible things. And, and I don't want you to miss out. I don't want you to miss the opportunities we have this week. So make sure you come uh, back tonight. And also, I'll re-echo again. Wednesday night is going to be an incredible night as we look at the Passover uh, from Rabbi David. Rabbi is a Messianic Jewish rabbi uh, here at Tikvot. And I think you're going to be just blessed to hear David, to meet David and his family. It's going to be just a real special night uh, for a church. So we're over in 15 now, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, finishing off this passage this morning. Uh, as you know, if you were here last week and as we have kind of started this track, Jesus' ministry had been based in Capernaum. He's been there for at least a year and a half, ministering, uh, raising up the disciples. He's kind of shifted a little bit now. The gospel is going to go outside of that area. He's gone out into the Gentile area. And the Gentile area is very simple, anything that's not Jewish. So these are non-Jews, and the gospel, as we heard last week, went out to the Syrophoenician woman who was a Canaanite. And if you know the Canaanites, are, that was the people that God had uh, told the children of Israel to rid the land of. But in God's good graces, he saves this Syrophoenician woman. And then uh, we know even back at Christmas, if you're with us, we walk through the book of Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. The Moabites were those that, that God had told them to get rid of. He didn't want to have them have anything to do with them. But in God's grace and mercy, he saved Ruth out of uh, that people. And so God is a God of grace. And God here, as we will see in this passage, is going to... Uh, Jesus is going to go and feed another uh, large crowd. A lot of liberal scholars, hopefully none in this crowd, but a lot of liberal scholars will try to uh, discredit this passage because they'll say, well, this is just somewhat a, a new version of the feeding of the 5,000. They're both uh, recorded here in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we know the feeding of the 5,000, though, was for a predominantly Jewish Crowd. It was mostly Jews that had gathered. It was in a different location. It was at a different time of the year. And this is going to be 4,000 men, not counting women and children. So in both cases, that is just counting the men. Uh, there are different amounts of baskets that are both used to distribute to the crowds and the fish. And in both cases, different uh, number of baskets were gathered together in this uh, message this morning. We're going to be looking at seven loaves and then seven baskets were full. They were a different type of basket in the feeding of 5,000. It's a much more smaller basket that was passed around. This one is a basket that it was so large, you and I could fit in this basket. It is literally the same word that is used in Acts when Paul was lowered down from the wall in a basket. So this is a very large basket of, uh, of bread that is distributed to the crowd. So a lot of different uh, things here as we jump into this. So uh, if you would and are able this morning, uh, as part of our continued time of worship, if you would stand as we read these uh, last uh, few verses in Matthew 15, starting in verse 29. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat, and went to the region of Magadan. Father, we thank you for your word. May you give us ears to hear, and our hearts may be opened by your word through your spirit, that we may be challenged and convicted this morning to do as you have called us to do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May you be seated. Well, we know that this, in fact, is a historical event. It really occurred, and that is because Jesus himself will tell us in Matthew 16 
that this event actually occurred. He says, as the disciples are still struggling to grasp everything that's going on, still at times struggling to, to really have the faith that they, at this point, we would think they should have, but yet that kind of gives us, a, a, at times, I guess, some level of encouragement to know that these uh, folks, these men that have been with Jesus for at least a year and a half to this point, have seen him perform incredible miracles. They've witnessed the feeding of 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and yet they still struggle here in verse uh, 9 of chapter 16 Jesus says do you not yet perceive do you remember do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 then obviously he knows the answer no they don't already they've already forgot and how many baskets you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered so Jesus is going to make reference to both of these feedings the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the uh, 4,000. So this is a historical event. They are very distinct. Uh, he is in an area now that was referred to as the Decapolis. It was an area of 10 cities. It is a Gentile area in modern day Jordan. So if you can envision or if you have a Bible that has the, um, it's one thing about the, you know, the old style Bibles is if you have uh, a lot of them, guess what they have in the back? maps right and it's really cool so if you got this bible i mean you probably pull up on your phone i don't know but i just again just good old bible is good here if you look at those maps and you take a peek and you see there the sea of galilee he is in the southeast quadrant of the sea of galilee now and this was an area that was a Gentile area. It was what's considered as East Manassas uh, when the 12 tribes divided the land out. But he is east of the Sea of Galilee, east of the Jordan River. Uh, so if you were there currently, you would be in modern day Jordan. But this area is separate. He has gone there after having tracked from Tyre and Sidon. He's come down back towards the Sea of Galilee, has looped down around the right side and come down to the southeast corner. Now, very similar to when he fed the 5,000, we will see very early on this. It says, first, he called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd. Again, very similar to what we read in the prior account of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, this idea of compassion is that, that deep pit in the stomach. It's, a very, it's even physically affects Jesus. It was, it was physically uh, driving him to respond. Uh, he was so moved, he, he had to respond to the needs of the people. So we see him here having, again, this compassion. Uh, this area, though, uh, is very different than the other areas he had been in as this area is predominantly Gentile. Uh, they have not uh, only, they've only heard briefly about the Messiah. John Piper uh, has this. He says, the highest of missionary motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, important as that is, nor love for sinners who are alienated and perishing, strong as that incentive is, especially when we contemplate the wrath of God. But rather, the highest motive of a missionary should be zeal, a burning, passionate zeal for the glory of Jesus Christ. You see, you and I will never have this level of compassion if we do not have that burning zeal for the glory of Christ. We can see the need, but in our culture today, we kind of are inundated uh, with tragedy. We, we watch the news. It's 24-7. We, we see all the time these uh, horrific acts that take place. As we, you know, if you paid attention to the news, what happened in, outside of Moscow just Friday night at a concert hall. I mean, we live in a, we live in a fallen world. Uh, with fallen people who uh, do things to harm other people. And that is a, a byproduct of the fall. But we can get overwhelmed with the needs and the, and the difficulties that people go through to the point that sometimes uh, it almost becomes a, a paralysis that we don't do anything because we don't know that what we do is really going to make a difference. But as Jesus looked out over this crowd and he saw the needs, he had spent three days with him. A, a, another part of this uh, account that's different than feeding at 5,000. That was in an afternoon. He has spent three days with this crowd. Again, a, a large crowd, more than likely, again, possibly as many as 15,000 people. If you can just envision that many people have gathered. Uh, this area is, is way more barren. If you re reflect back to the feeding of the 5,000, uh, he had had them sit down in a, in a grassy area. So most likely it was around springtime. 
Here the text tells us he had them sit down on the ground. It was more dirt, so we're probably later summer. So they're not only different locations, it's different times of the year, they're different people. Uh, there is a lot of differences to this story. Now you also need to take into account, you need to go to the Gospel of Mark, you need to read the very tail end of Mark chapter 7, and then particularly Mark chapter 8. That's going to kind of help fill in the gaps. You've got to understand, Matthew, again, is not always trying to give us a chronological order. Okay, Matthew is, is showing us that, that Jesus is God. He is deity. He is God incarnate. Uh, Mark is Peter's account. So Mark is still written from an eyewitness account. It is simply Peter's account, though. Uh, John Mark would have been a very young man uh, during the, the ministry of Jesus. But uh, as you read through Scripture, we know that Timothy ultimately uh, kind of, I mean, uh, Paul uh, restores John Mark at a, at a time. And John Mark obviously spent some, a great deal of time with Peter. And so that's his account. So Peter and Matthew were both participants in these miracles. They both not only uh, participated, but they also were used by Christ. Christ used them in this uh, fulfilling of this miracle as they helped distribute uh, the bread and uh, the fishes. So the first thing, again, we want to consider is the compassion, that Jesus is compassionate on the crowds. Um, Romans 9.15 says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, we've seen this throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, back in just the last chapter, chapter 15, 32, we saw that Jesus said, I have compassion. We saw in Matthew chapter 14, verse, four, verse 14, says that Jesus went forth, saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion. We even back into chapter 9 of the Gospel of Matthew, in verse 36, Jesus looked on the multitude, and it says he was moved with compassion because they were scattered as a sheep without a shepherd. God is a God of compassion. He is a compassionate God. He came and he took on flesh and blood that he could live amongst us, that he fully understands all areas of struggle and hurt. Here in this passage, they are bringing people to him. In Lamentations, we, are set, we, are, we read that, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope, for the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Amen? That's good news, that God's mercies never come to an end, that they are new every morning, for great is your faithfulness. I believe there's a pretty good, pretty good old hymnal song by that title. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. God is a God of compassion. He is a God of grace and mercy. And then even over in the book of Jonah, you remember Jonah. Jonah was kind of like this reluctant prophet. He didn't really want to do what God called him to do. Not only did he not even really want to do it, he kind of got mad at God for telling him to do it. You know, I mean, and, and, and live to tell the story, right? I mean, I'm thinking you start telling God not only you don't want to do what he tells you he wants you to do, but then you get angry at God. I'm thinking, all right, you know, yeah, uh, what's coming next, right? It's going to be a lightning bolt. What's going to happen, right? But God used Jonah even through Jonah's disobedience of not wanting to do what God called him. So look at Jonah chapter 4, though, because, again, we're going to see God's great compassion. Uh, you know, he had been called to go to the Ninevites, and he didn't want to go to the Ninevites. He was like, you know what, God, I'm okay if they just get wiped off the face of the earth. If I never have to see a Ninevite, that would be okay with me. But God is gracious and mercy. Again, the Ninevites were not a people that the, the children of Israel were to both to really have any interactions with. Uh, that would be in modern-day Syria. Chapter 4 of Jonah, starting verse 1, said it, but it displeased Jonah. <laughs> but it displeased, it, it displeased please Jonah exceedingly and he was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said oh Lord is not this what I said when I was yet in my country that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish for and those what he says there's such a great great reminder for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster Amen? Aren't you glad? Because, by the way, that's you and I's story, right? Because of God's mercy, when we were not looking for God, newsflash, folks, you have never looked for God, okay? You did not have a time in your life that you woke up and just said, you know what, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek out the... No, God's Spirit is what worked in you to even give you the ability to have that thought. 
It is God who is at work in you by his spirit that draws us to himself. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Jesus had this great compassion for these crowds that had come and, and, and were just following him for three days. And clearly they would not have packed any kind of uh, food that would have carried them three days. So they're out here, they're hungry, uh, they're out exposed to whatever would come about. Uh, John Bunyan has a great uh, reminder. He says, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. Now that someone is Christ. We cannot repay Christ for what he has done. That's why it is a gift of grace, and it is by faith. We cannot repay Christ for what he has done by taking our sin, our shame, dying on the cross, atoning for our sins, imputing his righteousness uh, to us, and taking ours upon himself. We can never repay that. But also, as we will see as we walk through this passage, another thing we cannot ever, uh, we can ever repay is, is, is just, you know, just salvation in general. You see, all we can do is be messengers. All we can do is share the gospel. But for so many of us, we want to be that person in that time that, that just by God's grace alone also is there when that person comes to faith. But you understand that God's the one who did the work to begin with, and you don't know how many people over the years have been praying how many other people have been faithfully sharing the gospel? And you just, had the, you just had the privilege of being there. But how many of us are willing to just be simply a, a dash in that journey? That we were faithful in praying for that person, who, that they would come to faith or whatever. Because that can never be repaid. We're reminded in Peter that we are to humble ourselves, though, for under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, and here it is, because he cares for you. God cares for you. We see this in the second part here as, as all these people have come, and you kind of got to go into the Gospel of Mark to get, to get more of this, but all of these folks have been coming to him with all of these uh, great ailments. And the Scriptures, in, and, and you have to really look more into the Greek to understand some of these words, to understand what they really mean. But when Mark tells us that they brought to him the lame and they brought to him the crippled, understand that these were people who didn't just have a, uh, a seasonal allergy. No offense if you do, right? Or, or happen to have, you know, uh, you know a, a head cold. No, these were people who, literally the word in Greek for lame uh, is the idea of those who were maimed or even having missing arms or a foot. I mean, they were people who were uh, greatly distressed. Even those who were crippled in the Greek, it's the idea of meaning, it's the meaning of the word crooked, which would include disabilities due to mutilation. So when the Bible talks about the fact that Jesus healed these people, he's illy, he is literally restoring a hand to someone. He has given them uh, literally uh, parts of their body that did not even exist. Only God can do that. None of these false prophets, these false you know, charlatans out there today, you know, they fake a lot of stuff, but you can't make a hand reappear. Amen? This is only the God of the universe who can do this. And yet that's what Jesus is doing. He is restoring people to their, to their uh, original. He is, he is healing all forms of uh, ailments and all forms of disabilities. And notice again, he's doing this in a Gentile area. He's not doing this to uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No, he is reaching into the Gentile uh, communities here. He's given us really what is a prophetic picture of the ultimate kingdom to come, which is which we are products of. Uh, we are part of that. We are Gentiles. If you're not Jewish, you are a Gentile. And because of that, we have been grafted into the body of Christ as, as those who place their faith and hope in Christ alone. We are now part of the church, the big C church, universal church. And so we see him as he uh, extends this and as he heals those. Alfred Edersham, who was a, a great Jewish scholar, says that the Lord ended each phase of his ministry with a feeding. 
He ended the ministry in Galilee with the feeding of the 5,000. He ended the ministry in the Gentile area where we're looking at today with the feeding of the 4,000. And he ended his, uh, his last week, his pa the Passion Week of Christ that we are entering today. Today is uh, that, you know, that, that last week that Jesus came and he comes into uh, Jerusalem for that last week that he will spend here on uh, with his disciples before the Passover. Uh, we're about a, not quite a year from that in this timetable. He's been with the disciples, training them for about a year and a half. He's got probably a little less than a year left with them. But at the end of that time, on what we would celebrate as, you know, Monday, Thursday, this coming Thursday night, where we would celebrate uh, that Jesus had the last Passover, uh, where he institutes the new covenant. Remember, we have a, a time each month that we gather and we, we partake in the Lord's Supper. But don't forget, it was a supper. It was dinner. So we see this throughout his ministry. He, he so often ended his ministry with a feeding. And we now are beneficiaries of that, that we get to feed off of the very word of God. We have a, a completed revelation. We have a completed canon of scripture that we can feed off the, the goodness of God that he has provided for us. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, says that since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus sees the crowd. He really sees them. We get so consumed, and, it's, and I'm not uh, faulting this. It's just a reality of, uh, of our fallen stealth, that we get so consumed with, with things in our own world and things in our own life and the things that we kind of get caught up in that so often we, we forget to see those that are around us, that, that there are those around us that have need. There are neighbors. There are workmates. There are uh, family and friends. There are those that have needs, and some of those are physical needs. Some of those are, are, are different type needs. But understand that even with those needs, as we seek to minister and to care for those, it cannot be done apart from the gospel. If you do it apart from the gospel, then you are a government agency, right? If you are just meeting needs and you are not including the gospel, then you're no different than any social service out there. We do all that we do so that the gospel can ultimately be proclaimed. To feed those that are hungry and clothe those that are in need. To do any of those things. Not that those things are bad, but to do those without the gospel is actually nothing more than uh, just you know helping them to feel better in the moment. But we're not giving them the actual hope that they need, that you and I need. We see this in this passage, especially in Mark's gospel, that the lame begin to walk, the cripples had their literally missing limbs restored, the blind begin to see, the mute begin to speak, and so on and so on. We see miracles after another. James reminds us that what good is this, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly, poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? We need to care for people. We need to work to help people if it's though ultimately to share the gospel. Martin Luther says we are saved by faith alone, but that faith, but the faith that saves is never alone. We are called to share. Our faith is an active faith. We aren't just we're saved and then that's it. No, we are, we are active in our faith. First uh, John chapter 3 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Jesus not only saw the crowds, he responded. He healed he fed them. He shared the truth. Charles Spurgeon says that the Lord's mercy often rides to the door of a heart upon the black horse of affliction. You ever notice so often when we are in those despair times, those difficulties, that, that so often when we, we, we kind of feel more the presence of the Lord, look, he's always there. 
It's just those are the times that we become more desperate for him. But what would happen if we had that sort of desperateness at all times? And we see Jesus is breaking down every barrier there was. Again, understand that as just in the prior uh, last week, I mean, the Gentiles are referred to as dogs. They're not referred to, they are, they are unclean, they're nobodies. They are told to stay away from the Gentiles. There are people that you and I probably think there is no hope, there is no way this person has been hardened, and yet God in his infinite wisdom and in his sovereign hand, there is still hope as long as they are breathing they still have time to respond to the gospel. We just need to be faithful to trust that God in his time, if it is God's desire to save that person, we need to be praying and sharing the truth. We need to have a concern for the lost. And that's the thing. We see Jesus is concerned for these people, but his concern for them is not just to heal them, not just to feed them. His concern is that they would know him, that they would come and trust him as their savior. D.O. Moody says that we don't have to go to heathen lands today to find false gods. America is full of them. Whatever you love more than God is your idol. Right? Every Sunday morning when I'm headed here to church and I'm passing by this new arena down here in Henrico County where Virginia Center Commons is, every Sunday morning, 7, 7.15 in the morning, packed out. Largest house of worship in our community. Largest house of worship anywhere around here except for they're not worshiping Jesus. I mean, people worship something. We all worship. What, though, and who do we worship? We can make, Calvin says, we can turn anything into an idol, that the heart is an idol factory. And by the way, most of the time, they're good things. They're not bad things, they're good things, because that's how we justify it, because we can put so many of these things ahead of the Lord and we just have seen this you uh, just yesterday we were uh, just kind of a full house here all day we had our good news club training here because we're going to be going into Elmont Elementary School in the number of weeks and starting a good news club where we're going to be sharing the gospel every single week for six weeks with kids at that uh, school hopefully that's just the the start of many others our uh, upwards ministry was uh, running yesterday and they're hearing the gospel Uh, each week as those kids and those families, many of whom are not church. It's opportunities for us to share the truth we know in Christ Jesus and to see them come to faith. We had a church that met here last night. They were uh, in our facility, and they are reaching people in our community. John Piper has this to say, missions exist because worship doesn't. Let that sink in for a second. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. You know, there's, we, we, there's no mission work in heaven, right? There's only one thing we will do, and that is worship Jesus. He says it is a temporary necessity but worship abides forever. Amen. I mean, we, we live in a day and time that, you know, we don't put a lot of stock into gathering with our brothers and sisters and worshiping Christ. We, we have all these other excuses. Well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You're right. You don't have to go home to your wife to be married, but you ain't going to stay married long. And if somehow she's dumb enough to keep you around, then, then you know, it is not going to be a good marriage. I mean, if you never are home, I mean, if you're never there, that's not a good husband. Well, we're called to be the body and the bride of Christ who died for us, who gave us life. We should desire to come and to worship with God's people. A.W. Pink says, The nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misrepresented by the present-day evangelist. He announces a Savior from hell rather than a Savior from sin. And that is why so many are fatally deceived, for there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and worldliness. Let that sink in for a moment. There are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire. We'll purchase fire insurance. But folks, that's that's not enough. 
Christ died to set us free. He died for our sins so we would be delivered from the world. J.C. Rawls says that Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. The problem is we spend so much time justifying our sin that we don't even know what sin is anymore. We don't understand the deep recesses of our own hearts. We don't pray that God would search our hearts as the psalmist tells us to do. To search our heart, that God would reveal to us those areas in our lives that need to be cleansed, they need to be repented of. He says, we must know the depth and the malignity of our disease in order to appreciate the great physician. We are called to so much more. Jesus cared deeply. Notice verse 37, and they all ate and were satisfied. They were satisfied. Christ was enough. He was enough for all that they needed. It wasn't just the, the food. Yes, they were fed. It wasn't just the healings, even though they, they had been healed. No, it was Christ is enough. He is enough for you and I, no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we may experience in the future. Christ is enough. And he is the only one who can carry us through. We see all these tragedies all around us, and yet we allow our political viewpoints to cloud our, uh, our, our judgment so often. Uh, case in point, he saw the people. You ever consider today that there are more Christians coming to faith in Christ in Iran than anywhere in the world? Right? But we hear, and it's understandable, right, what's going on and, and what Iran is doing to back these proxy groups and fund all of these different uh, enemies out there. Why do you think that is happening? Just for two seconds, just think about this spiritually and not through the lens of a, a news source. Read it through this lens. It is because Satan is losing a stronghold on a people he has had for a long time. And the more that occurs, the more we will see these things occur with groups. We will see in, in countries that we... Do you not think that God has got an incredible remnant of believers in North Korea? Because if you don't, then you don't know my God. Because I can guarantee you there is a remnant that is strong, that is, that is sharing the truth in North Korea today. And I think one day we're going to stand around heaven and we're going to see people from every nation, every tongue, every people, right? And we're going to be amazed at some of these people groups that we didn't even think. Maybe we didn't even know they existed. But you have to understand the enemy is watching as we are. We should have such compassion on these brothers and sisters that are in these countries. That's why we're trying to take more initiative and being more engaged and more involved in both supporting our missionaries and also with the gospel work and the gospel advancement that is going forth in so many areas of the world. And we need to pray for these brothers when you spend time. And, you know, even this past week, we were able to see another, uh, an ethnic Ethiopian plant. And, and, you know, we want to be a support to these folks because I don't know about you, but if you open your eyes just long enough, you're going to realize the world has come here, right? And if you don't even think it's come to this community, then we are blinded by what God is actually doing. God has sent the world to us. You're going to hear even more about that tonight. The fact that, you know, we are, uh, we are in the uh, state now that has the second fastest growing Muslim communities in the United States, right? We have to be better prepared to engage the loss, but that's only going to happen when we start to see them. And when we don't view them as someone who's just a different ideology and a different religion, but we view them as someone who's created in the very image of God that you and I were, and they do not know the hope that is within us. And when we stop playing games as being these little carnal Christians, which you're in the possibility to be, and we start to have a deep burden for the lost, and we start saying that I am willing to do whatever it takes to see people come to faith. And that's going to take massive change in our hearts that only God's spirit is going to be able to work in to do. We can't even do that ourselves very well. It's going to require God to move in our hearts in such a way that we truly see the loss the way Christ sees them. So I just want to encourage you uh, today that even today there may be somebody here who's never by faith trusted Jesus Christ alone. You may have had a workspace salvation where you think you've done this and that, but I'm saying if you've experienced Christ, then Jesus changes you. You cannot meet a king, a sovereign king, and go back to living the way you did before. It's an impossibility. 
If you have come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, then the very spirit of Christ himself is within us and he will lead you and he will guide you. It doesn't mean we're sinless. Hopefully we're sinning less, but it means that we are being conformed more and more and more into the image of Christ, not the other way around. And we want to be, we want to be that church that is set on a hill. We want to be a beacon of light in this community and in this uh, county and throughout this commonwealth and even around the world. But we have to stay, see the loss for who they are. So I just um, want to leave that with you and, and, and for each of us to consider what do we need to do next? What is the next step? For some, maybe it is salvation, that that's the next step you need to take by placing your faith in Christ alone. For others, maybe it's a public proclamation of baptism. And you may have been baptized as a kid or something, but maybe you really hadn't had a genuine saving conversion. And now you have, and that means now you're about, you need to publicly proclaim that. Because your baptized, baptism before was just a bath. All right? If it was not based on a credible profession of faith in Jesus Christ alone, you just took a bath at church. All right? This is about salvation or, 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 or allowing God to use those gifts, those talents, those abilities that, that he gives us by his spirit to be used for his good and his glory. That we truly can give all we are because he and he alone is worthy. So I'm going to pray and then, um, and then we're going to uh, sing. And I want you to really consider as we uh, sing, great is thy faithfulness, that do we believe it and do we live it? Father, we thank you for the great truth of your word that, God, you have called us and you have set us apart to, for so much more, Father. But, God, we don't do this on our own, that, Father, we can only do what uh, we do through the power of your spirit, God. So I pray that you would draw us. I pray that we'd be people of your word, that we would desire to be in your word, because your word is going to continually um, just conform us more and more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's going to chisel away those areas in our life that we just have allowed to get hardened and calloused or maybe there's pride or whatever else those areas that, that creep in so easily father we know they do that's why we have to uh, daily have that time that we confess and come to you but father i pray if there's anyone here this morning that you would draw them to yourself i pray that for all the others god that god we would understand what it truly means to surrender that doesn't mean that god we are um to, to, to make a vow of poverty, but God, that we would truly start to see the lost and understand that, God, all we have is yours. And then, Father, may, we, may you use um, all that we are for your good and your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. The song will be on the screen, but if you also want to sing along with the hymnal, it's, in, it's page 96, Great Is Your Faithfulness.
Sings all mine and ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. his face shine upon you. I'm going to pray for us, but then I'm going to ask you to just take a couple of minutes. Don't move, don't leave, don't rush out, just to reflect on what it is that we pray that the Word of God has hopefully stirred in your heart by his Spirit's leading. Arthur will start strumming, and that will be the time that we would ask you to then leave. But don't leave without taking uh, this minute. Don't disrupt what God may be doing, speaking to those around you. Father, we thank you for you are so gracious and merciful and mighty. Father, you are faithful when we are not. You are loving when we are unloving. God, you are grace and mercy when we are not. Father, you have called us by name. You have given us new life in Jesus Christ. May we not take that for granted, that, Father, we too were once destitute and lost, but God, you came to us when we could not go to you. You drew us to yourself by your spirit. And Father, we pray that may we be a reflection of the very glory of Christ in the way that we live our lives. As we leave from here this morning, may we go forth as ambassadors for Christ. May we be a representative that not only shows, but we share the hope we have within us. And Father, may all we do and all we say May it bring glory and honor to our King, to Jesus Christ. Amen.